So today I'm going to finish off uh, on the crystallography of martensitic transformations. Uh, and I'll begin by asking you the question, uh, what is the most important characteristic of a martensitic transformation? No, it's a, a diffusion-less transformation. Uh, and in that sense, it is one of the most simple transformations to predict because there is no composition change at all. Uh, but you see that uh, there are complications. Um, so the reason why we know it's diffusionless is it can form, a uh, martensite can form at incredibly low temperatures, for example, 4 Kelvin. Yeah? It's possible to get martensitic transformation as 4 Kelvin, where diffusion is basically inconceivable even for the smallest of uh, atoms. And also martensite can form extremely rapidly. So do you have any idea roughly of how rapidly martensite can form? What would be the speed of growth? Thousands of meters per second, uh, which is um, uh, the speed of sound is of the order of 5,000 meters per second in steel. And when you have transformation happening that fast, can you hear? Yeah. Uh, so if you have an Android phone, you can download this app free of charge, where you can hear the Martin side forming. Actually, <laughs> it's uh, it, it it's like uh, it's like a, a chorus of bells. You know, you confirm that for me, right? Yeah. Uh, so those are uh, audible clicks uh, because you know plates grow rapidly and then they are arrested. So you release some uh, acoustic energy in that process. Um, and how can we verify that there is no composition change? What are the experimental techniques you have? Uh, uh, SEM, but what? EDX. Yeah. EDX stands for? Uh, the energy dispersive X ray analysis, okay? So, you know, when the beam strikes your material, you get X rays emitted, and those are characteristics of the elements inside the material. Uh, but the resolution of that technique uh, is of the order of a few micrometers because, you know, even though the beam is narrow, it spreads out inside your sample. Is there any other even higher resolution technique? Sorry? Uh, wavelength dispersive gives you uh, access to light elements and so on, but. Uh, a higher resolution would be in a transmission electron microscope because the thickness of a foil is uh, of the order of uh, 200 angstrom. So the beam can't spread more than 200 angstrom. And finally, there's uh, the atom probe technique where we can pull out indi individual atoms and measure the uh, time of flight between two uh, locations. And from that, uh, you can chemically analyze individual atoms. Okay. So uh, there's absolutely no doubt that martensitic transformation is a completely diffusionless transformation. Uh, this is what uh, martensite looks like. Uh, it's in the form. Uh, so what would you call this shape? Lenticular. That means lens-like. So in three dimensions, what would it look like? Plates. Yeah. So you can see that these are not needles. All right because there are no circular cross-sections that you see. The whatever plane you look at, it will be in the form of a lens-shaped object. And the key thing to note also is that these lenses are sharp at their tips, right? And we'll understand why that is the case uh, later on. So the tips of these plates are sharp, and they are in the form of thin plates. Now, the reason why they're in the form of thin plates and we'll do this uh, quantitatively in a short time, is because <coughs> there is constraint from surrounding material. And you know, you know that martensitic transformation involves deformation, right? So to minimize the strain energy due to that deformation, it adopts a thin plate shape. And we'll see why later on. But supposing you, are, you only have a single crystal, and it's surrounded by air then uh, basically there's nothing to resist the formation of martensite and we will simply pick up the deformation due to martensite it won't be in the form of a thin plate right 
So, we can get what is known as single interface transformations. That means uh, you have a single crystal and then the interface is moving and it accomplished the de accomplishes a deformation and you basically adopt the shape of the crystal plus the deformation caused by martensite. So, in most cases we are looking at polycrystalline materials. So, this is surrounded by lots and lots of other crystals and therefore it forms as thin plates. But the strange thing about this is that the plate forms on specific crystallographic planes, all right? But those crystallographic planes are not simple ones like 1 1 1 2 9, uh, you know, I've labeled that as approximate habit plane indices. The actual habit plane is irrational. That means, you know, uh, one uh, uh, square root of 2 is an irrational number, it goes on forever, right? So, why should martensite form on these weird planes, okay? and also be rational because when we think about slip deformation you know it happens on closed pack planes in closed pack directions and so forth and yet we have you know approximately 315 10 and 252 and so on so why does it form on these strange crystallographic planes and if we look at the orientation relationship between the austenite and the martensite then you'll find that the closed pack planes of the two phases are approximately parallel, but they might be inclined at 0 0.51 of a degree, but they are not exactly parallel, okay? And the closed pack directions in those planes are approximately parallel as well, and you know, that's, that's uh, given in your notes, I think. When we write that 1 1 1 is parallel to 0 1 1 alpha in, in, uh, as on the board, those are approximations. There is actually an angle between those two planes and a finite angle between the closed back directions in those planes. So it's very strange that the orientation relationship itself is also irrational. And we need to explain all these features. So both the habit plane and the orientation relationship is irrational. Now, in the last lecture, we dealt with interfaces and we created an interface by taking a single crystal, slicing it into half and tilting one half about the other through an axis uh, poking normal to the plane of the board. Okay? And therefore, you are left with a, a gap here and that gap consists of an array of edge dislocations in this case. Uh, so, we know that the structure of an interface consists of dislocations and in a transmission electron microscope, we can see those dislocations and we can work out the Burgers vectors and so forth. So, you, you should think about interfaces basically as consisting of dislocations and in this case, the two crystals have the same structure, okay, because we started with a single crystal, we cut it. But the interface between martensite and austenite also consists of a set of dislocations, uh, but these dislocations will be different uh, because they accomplish transformation. So, do you know of any kind of dislocation which changes the structure when it moves? So, normal dislocation, you know, has its uh, Burgers vector, a lattice vector, right? Therefore, when you translate you recover the structure, but do you know of any dislocation which changes the structure? You've done this, okay? Yeah, and uh, in what context? Like, uh, antiphase, boundaries. antiphase boundaries or um, say I want to transform FCC to HCP. You know the Shockley partial, have you heard of that? So, the closed back plane of FCC looks uh, something like this. So, this might be the closed back plane of austenite, where the atoms are touching along the 3 1 1 0 type directions. Uh, if I draw a lattice vector, that means a vector uh, which takes you from a lattice point to another lattice point, then that is the lattice parameter divided by 2 into 1 1 0. 
And that takes me from a lattice point to a lattice point. So a dislocation with this Burgers vector would not change the structure. However, if I now draw these two vectors here, this one and this one, this is a by 6 uh, into 2, 1, 1. And this one is a by 6 into 2, 1, bar 1. So a by 2, 1, 1, 0 is equal to a by 6 into 2, 1, 1 plus a by 6 into 2, 1, bar 1, where this is a lattice vector, vector, but these are partial dislocations, uh, partial vectors. So if you have a dislocation with a Burgers vector a by 6, 2, 1, 1, then that's known as a Shockley partial. And its movement will change the stacking sequence of austenite, which is uh, ABC, ABC for the 1, 1, 1 planes, into AB, AB, etc., uh, which is the hexagonal close packed lattice. So if I put a Shockley partial on every successive plane, then I can transform my hexagonal close back structure, uh, my uh, cubic close back structure into a hexagonal close back structure. So we get the gamma to epsilon martensitic transformation. So in the case of the interface between martensite and austenite, these dislocations will be partial dislocations, but they will still be recognizable as dislocations. That means they have a line vector and a Burgers vector. We also need to distinguish between uh, an interface that can glide without diffusion and an interface which requires diffusion to move. So in the top diagram here, uh, the Burgers vectors of the dislocation lie outside of the plane of the interface and therefore they can glide uh, given an appropriate driving force. Okay? So either stress or uh, you cool the austenite down to transform into martensite. So these do not require any diffusion to move. They are just like slip. On the other hand here, the dislocations have the Burgers vectors lying in the plane of the interface. So we call this a sessile interface because in order for this to move, you would need to remove rows of atoms if the interface is to translate from um, <coughs> uh, left to right or you need to add rows of atoms to those extra half planes for the reverse motion. So this kind of in an interface is impossible for martensitic transformations because we know that you can form martensite at 4 Kelvin when it's not possible for dislocations to climb. Okay? You're familiar with dislocation climb, right? Yeah. So the first condition uh, for an interface to be consistent with martensitic transformation is that it must be glissile. Right? It must be able to move without any diffusion at all. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Right, now there is a, a second condition. Um, so far we have talked about interfaces consisting of an array of dislocations but a single array of dislocations and that's because you know we looked at a simple boundary which is a tilt about a one axis, right? But a general misorientation you can describe as a combination of rotations. We've done that already. And each one of those rotations will require an array of dislocations to accommodate that misfit. So in general, you know, an interface might consist of an array of dislocations like this and another one like this and so on. Okay? And then there is a problem because the dislocations start to interfere with each other. 
and I'll explain that with this diagram. Have you heard of jogs? Okay, so jogs happen when two set uh, two dislocations with different Burgers vectors cross each other. So, for example, here I have a dislocation which is uh, an edge dislocation with a Burgers vector B1, and here is a screw dislocation with a Burgers vector B2. When they cross, this dislocation will acquire a step which is equal to the Burgers vector of this dislocation and vice versa. Yeah? Because you know, when this dislocation crosses this, this one will cause a step to form along B2. Um, here you are, the first um, dislocation acquires a step parallel to B2, and this one acquires a step parallel to B1. Yeah? Is everyone happy with that? Now, what was originally a screw dislocation here has now acquired an edge component because the Burgers vector is constant along the line vector, right? And therefore, you know, originally the screw could glide on any plane containing it, its line vector. Now it cannot do so. So when dislocations interfere, uh, you will render the, them sessile. Okay? They won't be able to move. So the second condition for a Martin-Sittig uh, interface is that it can only contain one array of dislocations, right? So the first condition was that the interface must be glissile. Must be glissile. And the second condition is that um, only one array of dislocations. array of dislocations to avoid interference, to avoid interference <coughs> and for example, jogs which are sessile. So, uh, if I now, um, supposing this is the Martin Site Austenite interface, and if I look at the plan view, then I should only be able to see um, one array of dislocations in the interface. Okay. Now, what that means is that there cannot be any misfit along the line vector, because if there is any misfit, then I need another array of dislocations to accommodate that misfit. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? So that line vector uh, between the dislocations must be a fully coherent um, line. Therefore, the line vector of dislocations in interface must be fully coherent. between gamma and alpha prime. So gamma is the parent phase, austenite, and alpha prime is the martensite. And we call that uh, line vector an invariant line. That means it is undistorted and unrotated between the martensite and the austenite. So an invariant line. Which is undistorted and unrotated. probably can't read this, but invariant line and undistorted and unrotated. Okay. 
So this is a very strict condition that uh, you must be able to find a single line which is fully coherent between the two different crystal structures. Otherwise, martensitic transformation is impossible. Okay. So if you know, if I asked you a question in plutonium, can you get a martensitic transformation between monoclinic and triclinic forms? If you cannot find a fully coherent line between those two lattices, it's impossible to get martensite. Okay. So just with this simple condition, you can predict in any system whether or not martensitic transformation is possible. Okay. It's a fundamental condition for a glissile interface. So a glissile interface uh, cannot contain more than one set of dislocations because otherwise those dislocations interfere with each other and render the interface sessile. And martensitic transformation is only possible if the deformation which changes the parent into the product leaves one line at least completely invariant. <laughs> All right? And therefore, the deformation that changes the parent into the product uh, has the minimum condition that it should be an invariant line strain. That means it leaves one line completely undistorted and unrotated. Okay. And you can use this principle to predict whether or not martensitic transformation is possible between any two different crystal structures. Okay. So it's a completely general condition, not limited to steels or, uh, or any other material. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so um, given that we have this level of coherency in the interface, you can see from this table that the interface energy between the austenite and the martensite is really quite low. Yeah. If you measure the interfacial energy, it comes to only about 0 0.2 joules per meter squared, which is similar to that of a twin, and uh, you know that a twin boundary is fully coherent. Yeah. Uh, and if you compare with a general grain boundary, it's, it's a quarter of that value, and the surface energy of window glass is about one joule per meter squared. So this is a reflection of the fact that we must have at least a single line fully coherent. Okay? And if you go back to your uh, example of uh, FCC to HCP, do we satisfy that condition? You know, the basal plane and the closed back planes are, are completely coherent, aren't they, between HCP and um, FCC, right? 111 one plane is exactly the same as 0001 of HCP. So we satisfy the condition because every line in that plane is an invariant line, okay? Yeah, everyone happy with that? Okay. Uh, so, these are the structures that we are going to consider. First of all, we have the austenite, which is uh, cubic uh, F, and then the um, martensite, which we'll assume to be uh, um, either body centered cubic or body centered tetragonal if we have some carbon in the material. Right? Uh, so, it's perfectly possible to get martensitic transformation in pure iron, it's got nothing to do with the presence of carbon. It's the mechanism by which you transform the parent into the product. Okay. You'd have to cool at an incredibly high rate because the hardenability of pure iron is negligible. Okay. So uh, we do experiments where we cool at a million degrees C per second, and we can see the martensite forming in pure iron. Okay, so um, let's assume we've got a square lattice, right? And uh, we want to change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged without breaking any bonds because we do not have diffusion. So all near neighbors must be preserved, right? So we can do that by a physical deformation. Yeah. Okay. You can see that we've changed the pattern in which the atoms are arranged without uh, breaking any bonds. But the consequence of that is that the shape of the crystal has changed, the external shape of the crystal has changed, right? Uh, so th in this case, it's a shear deformation. Uh, and if we 
polish a crest, uh, uh, austenite completely flat, right, and then allow it to transform to martensite, we should see this happening. Okay. So in the next uh, slide, uh, this is a movie by Koseki in Japan, where we are looking at uh, a flat surface of austenite. These are austenite grains, and we allow it to transform into martensite. And you see that we see exactly that sort of a change happening. So those are martensite plates forming, which are tilting the surface. There is no etching here. We are just seeing the surface relief forming. So this is a real physical deformation and exactly like slip, except that we are changing the crystal structure at the same time. So you, you should think of martensitic transformation as a deformation which changes the crystal structure at the same time. And if we measure these, uh, these um, shape changes accurately, right? so we, we can use a technique like atomic force microscopy or scanning tunneling microscopy, or look at if, if the structure is sufficiently coarse, then scratches going across the austenite will be deflected, okay? and so on. So we can measure these things accurately, and they can be described as follows. So in the first uh, diagram here, if if I pull this material and I get a, a volume change along one direction, right, then this plane is left completely unchanged. Okay. So this is a, a deformation which we call an invariant plane strain because it's leaving that horizontal plane unchanged even though we've changed the volume. Uh, so this would happen, for example, if you have a material with a Poisson's ratio of zero. If I pull it, there's no lateral contraction, and beryllium has a Poisson's ratio, which is almost zero. So if you pull it, you won't see uh, a contraction in the horizontal directions. And this you are familiar with. Uh, you know, either slip or twinning will produce uh, a shear, but no change on the plane on which shear happens. So that's also an invariant plane strain. If I combine these two deformations, then I get a general invariant plane strain, which involves a shear deformation and a volume change normal to the habit plane. Right. And for martensitic transformations, the shear strain is of the order of 0 0.26 and the volume change is 0 0.03. So these are massive deformations, right? You know, if I, if I apply a stress of 200 megapascals to steel, what will be the strain? What will, yeah? Yeah, so, uh, you know, if we assume that the uh, modulus is 200 gigapascals, then it's 10 to the minus 3, right? Yeah? So, uh, these, this is 0.26, so these are massive deformations, right? And there's going to be a lot of um, strain energy created if your crystal is surrounded by other crystals, right? So, in an elastic deformation, um, if you want to calculate the strain energy, so if I plot the stress versus strain, here this is the shear strain and this is the shear stress, and in the elastic regime that gives us a straight line, then the area under this curve is the strain energy per unit volume, which is equal to half tau times gamma, and if I replace the shear stress by shear modulus times strain, then that simply becomes the shear modulus into gamma squared, so shear modulus, and this is the strain energy per unit volume, energy per unit volume. So it will vary with the square of the strain and with the modulus of the material. Okay. Uh, and if you look at the strain energy per unit volume for a plate of martensite, you have the strain squared terms here, right? And you have the modulus. The only difference between the equation on the board and this equation is that we also have this term 
which is the thickness over the length of the plate. And that term is really difficult to derive. You need to know Aschelbe's theory uh, for deriving that additional term, C, uh, C upon R. But I can explain it to you in very simple terms. So if I draw my austenite here, then as a consequence of um, transformation, the shape changes into something like this. And that is our shear strain, and that is our dilatational strain. Now, the displacement, as I move away from the habit plane here, habit plane, the displacements become larger and larger as we traverse from the habit plane. So these are displacements. Even though the strain is identical at every point because it's the displacement divided by the height. So if I now make uh, my martensite plate very thin, like so, then you can see that the displacement is minimal here. Is minimal. And this is what uh, makes the plate as a lens-shaped object with an extremely sharp tip because it minimizes the overall elastic strain energy, which we wrote as E equals C upon R into the shear modulus times S squared plus delta squared, where this is the aspect ratio of the plate. Plate. Okay. Everyone happy with that? And that's where that term C upon R comes from. If I make it fat, then I'm pushing an absolute distance, which is much greater with other crystals surrounding. So this is also the reason why mechanical twins are extremely thin, because you know the shear deformation for mechanical twins is even larger than for martensite. It's, uh, 0.7071, yeah, 1 over square root of 2 for mechanical twins. So they will form as extremely thin plates with very sharp tips, in contrast to annealing twins, which do not involve any deformation, so they form as blocky, you know, things which minimize the interfacial energy. Okay? So anything which involves uh, uh, a shear deformation and a volume change uh, normal to that uh, habit plane will form as thin plates because these are massive deformations that we are talking about compared with ordinary elastic strains. So I'm just going to summarize uh, the difficulties that I've pointed out so far. Uh, we have uh, strange habit planes, all right? And also uh, we have uh, irrational orientation relationships. And we've seen that the shape deformation that we observe is an invariant plane strain, right? You know, um, it's a combination of a shear and a volume change normal to the plane, so it's leaving the whole plane unchanged, unrotated and undistorted. Uh, IPS stands for invariant plane strain. But what I'm going to show you now is that it's impossible to transform austenite into martensite by a deformation which leaves a plane fully coherent. It's just impossible, okay? So our observation of the shape change is inconsistent with that, right? Okay, so imagine um, that uh, uh, we have two of these FCC cells plotted next to each other, like so, <coughs> here, okay? And I'll simply color these particular atoms of iron in red, and you can see that there's a body-centered tetragonal cell of which phase? No, I haven't done anything. <laughs> I've just relabeled the axes, okay? So 
So that's a body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite. But you can see that if I now you know, <coughs> compress it along the vertical axis and uniformly expand it along the horizontal axis, I can change that into a cube, right? So that is called the Bain strain, where uh, you have a deformation this way and a uniform expansion along the x and y axis, and you generate your cubic, uh, body-centered cubic structure. It's really a very beautiful um, deformation. You know, if you just look at the cells in isolation, it's difficult to see how you can change a face-centered cubic cell into a body-centered cubic cell. But when you look at it like this, it's straightforward. A compression along the z-axis and a uniform expansion along the x and y axes. So supposing now I represent the austenite as a sphere, okay, then the effect of the Bain deformation would be to change it into what shape? Yeah, like like a, a, a what is it a Malteser or you know what what is it is it a Malteser no not a Malteser hmm you know the uh, sort of <coughs> minstrels minstrels is the right word yeah okay thank you for that <laughs> yeah so so it will be compressed along the z-axis and expanded along x and y-axis. Yeah, so it will be an uh, ellipsoid of rotation around the z-axis. Uh, and if I look at a cross-section, so this is now my z-axis and this is my x-axis, then I've compressed along that axis and expanded along this axis. So this is a cross-section of that ellipsoid of revolution. And there are two vectors there, OA and OB, which are unchanged in length by this Bain deformation. Right? So, have we found our invariant lines? There are two vectors which are unchanged in length, right? Mm -hmm. why, do, why do you say no? Yeah, so they are rotated. Invariant means unrotated and undistorted. Okay. Now, I can recover. So, the Bain strain basically does not leave any line unchanged. Okay. Therefore, we cannot uh, satisfy the minimum condition for Martin Cetic transformation that we have an invariant line. All right. And also, of course, this is not the orientation relationship that we observe. Here, you know, you have the z-axis of the two cells parallel and the 100 zero zero parallel to 110 zero of the austenite, and that's not what we observe. Instead, we observe that the closed-back planes are roughly parallel, and the closed-back directions in those planes are roughly parallel. So the Bain strain not only doesn't give you an invariant line, it also doesn't explain the observed orientation relationship. Okay? Right. So, supposing now I take that ellipsoid, and I give it a rigid body rotation, all right? so that one of these lines comes into coincidence, the other one goes further out into coincidence, then I recover an invariant line. Okay? So the Bain strain combined with the rigid body rotation gives me the necessary line which makes Martin Cetic transformation possible. Okay? There's no way I can pick two, two lines to come into coincidence. So we still have the inconsistency with the observed shape deformation, but the rigid body rotation that I add to the Bain strain exactly predicts the observed irrational orientation relationship. Okay? So the condition for Martin Cetic transformation, when we implement that on the Bain strain by adding a rigid body rotation to recover this line, invariant line, exactly predicts the observed orientation relationship. So one problem is solved. Okay? That we can, given the lattice parameters, we can predict the amount of deformation in the Bain strain, and then when we find the rigid body rotation that recovers an invariant line, it exactly predicts the orientation relationship. But a fully coherent interface is impossible because there is no rotation which will give me coincidence of two lines, and two lines define a plane, right? Everyone happy with that? 
So, we still have an inconsistency okay, and uh, that is uh, again summarized here that we have solved the orientation relationship, uh, the shape deformation is still inconsistent <coughs> with the Bain strain and we have not explained why you know Martinsite chooses to form on very strange uh, but reproducible <coughs> crystallographic <coughs> planes. Now, everything that I am going to say is actually in your notes, so I, I need you to pay attention for the next, uh, next slide. Okay. Right, so this is blank of course, but um, I am going to introduce an austenite crystal here and it is in, in that particular shape to start with. Uh, when we transform it into martensite, we see the shape change. Uh, by effectively a shear, we will ignore the volume change for the moment, all right? but you see a shear. So, the shear would change that shape of the austenite crystal into that sort of a shape if I shear it on that plane, right? but we know that a shear deformation cannot change austenite into martensite because we only have one line coherent between the two lattices. right? So, this has to be the wrong crystal structure, it is exactly the shape change that we observe experimentally, but it has to be the wrong crystal structure. In order to recover the right crystal structure, I have got to add another shear on another plane, because the combination of two shears leaves only one line unchanged, right? the line at the intersection of those shear planes. So, if I do that, then I get the correct crystal structure but now it is the wrong shape because we do not observe that second step. Yeah? Where is the invariant line here? Um, the four at X. Exactly, exactly right. So, it is at the intersection of that shear plane and that shear plane. Okay? So, it is it's, uh, going through X normal to the board. So, we have a problem yeah, that we can either reproduce the right crystal structure uh, by having two shears, uh, which is the same as an invariant plane strain, uh, invariant line strain, or we get the right shape but the wrong crystal structure. Now, is there any deformation that I can add to this which will recover this shape but not change the crystal structure? Do you know of any kinds of deformation which do not change the crystal structure? Yeah, twinning or slip. slip. Yeah, so neither of those would change the crystal structure. So if I if I periodically <coughs> twin this, then the macroscopic shape here is as I observe here, and the crystal structure is unchanged. Now notice that these planes here can be rational planes, but the average plane here can be anything depending on how much twinning we have done, right? So, that immediately explains the strange planes on which the austenite, uh, uh, on which the martensite forms and we can predict those planes exactly by adding the correct amount of lattice invariant deformation, deformation which does not change the lattice uh, to recover the shape and that predicts exactly the habit planes that we observe. And in, the, uh, in this case, we predict also that we will observe twins inside the margin site and interfaces, yeah, twin interfaces inside the margin site. If we slip, then we predict that we observe the slip steps when we look at the interface in a transmission electron microscope and that is exactly what you see. But again, this, this plane is irrational because we are adding slip to correct the shape. Okay? So, this theory completely predicts all elements of the crystallography of martensitic transmissions and it is not just applicable to you know austenite and martensite in steels, but to any system in which martensitic transformation happens. So, for example, in plutonium, uh, plutonium uh, the liquid is denser than the solid. Okay? So, when the first uh, solid forms, it is actually less dense than the liquid and then it densifies by undergoing a series of four or five martensitic transformations between different complicated crystal structures. Okay? 
all that crystallography can be predicted. Similarly, in uranium and many other materials, shape memory elements in copper, zinc, nickel, titanium, etc. This theory applies to all of those. Okay, and it, it's a tremendous um, success explaining so much confusion that existed in the literature around the 1950s. So the original theory is due to Bowles and Mackenzie in Australia, and lack. Uh, Lieberman, Wexler, and Reed in the U.S. They basically simultaneously. Um, okay, so this theory is wonderful. It predicts accurately the crystallography of martensite, and we predict the structure that we see. And look at this. This is a transmission electron micrograph of a plate of martensite, and you can see extremely finely spaced twins inside, which are predicted by the theory. So the prediction was made before transmission electron microscopy became possible. Okay. Uh, so around the 19 early 1950s, uh, people used to use replicas in transmission electron microscopes until thin foils became possible. The replica, you can see the traces of the interfaces, but you can't prove that they are twins because uh, you need diffraction. So when uh, Suzuki in Japan uh, made a thin foil, you could actually prove that these are twins. Okay, so it's a rare instance in material science where the theory comes before the actual experimental evidence. Okay, okay. So I think that is my last slide, and that finishes the course. So you know, just imagine in nine lectures how much you've learned. Okay, so thank you very much, and we have an examples class in um, ten minutes. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you.